Yitzhakel Hashem Elohei Yankev, the name of the God of Jacob alone should support you. Yisra Hezer HaMikredesh, he should help you, send help from his holy chamber. Umitziyan Yisadeka, and from Zion, that is to say Yerushalayim, he should support you. Yisker Kol Mechoseho, he should recall Bring to mind all the offerings that you made for him, and animal offerings, sin thanksgiving offerings, atonements. Yudashna Sela, they should all be graciously accepted. He should grant your heart's requests. And all your good intentions. We make good intentions. Good resolutions, they should all be fulfilled. We should be able, we should be able to fulfill. He should give us the, the strength and the ability, the insight, the clarity to fulfill them. So we should rejoice. You should ask in your salvation, Hashem, will be shame, Eliheinu, Nidgel, will raise the banner of our in the name of our God on high. Should fulfill, will fulfill all your heart's requests. Atayodaiti, King David says, Now I know, Hashem saves his anointed one. Yanehu Mishmei Koche answers, answering him from his um, holy heavens, Bikvures with might, Yesha, salvation, Yamine from his right hand. Some come with their chariots, with their tanks. Others with their cavalry, with their drones, and who knows what else, their missiles. We come with the name of God on our lips. They fell, they did not get up. We arose, and they say that, and we're standing stalwart. Hashem shall deliver us. He is our king on the day that we call. Tanya, chapter three. The neshama and every aspect of the neshama. Nefesh, ruach, and neshama. Nefesh is the level of the neshama that connects, that gets down low enough to realize a connection with your physical body because your physical life and your spiritual life are two completely different worlds. The level that they can inter interact, that's called the nefesh. The ruach is the level of feelings. And the neshama is godliness. It's pure God. Okay, so on every one of these levels, we have a tenfold structure, which subdivides into two categories, intellect and emotion. Intellect is obviously in your brains, and emotions in your heart. The intellect is made up of three sephiros, three aspects called sephiros, like the English word for a sphere, sphere. The word sphere is also the word sapir, which is like the English word sapphire. The Ten Commandments were given on stone. What kind of stone? Not marble, sapphire. Most precious stone that there is. And we described these yesterday as inspiration, development, and connection. Knowledge means connection. You're connected to an idea, it shows, it will show in the way you behave because the connection inspires all your actions. Your actions, again, break down into seven different categories corresponding to the seven days of the week. The inner life of all of these actions comes from your ideas, but the ideas have to get to your heart and the connection between them is called knowledge. Without knowledge, there's no connection. Without knowledge, there's only fantasies. So a person can have a lot of fantasies, a lot of great ideas, but he doesn't know what he's talking about because he doesn't do anything about it. 
He can't do anything about it because there's no connection with the realm of ac action. The realm of action is sevenfold. Okay, we'll talk more about that. They're also called here on page 66 doubles because they work together. They work together. So that a person has love in his heart, the right side of the heart. I love to do things. I love this person. But I also have discipline. You know, I have to get up in the morning. I love my wife, but I have to earn a salary. I have to support the family. I have to pay the mortgage. I have to take everyone to the doctor. My wife takes them to the doctor, but I have to pay the bills and so on. You have to know what are the practical parameters of your love, how they're going to act. And they work together so that you have discipline that's really love. The father who doesn't discipline his child hates his child. Spoils the child and the child has a miserable life because his parents never showed him tough love to let him know how far he can go and how far he cannot go. And similarly, we have people who are very orderly and very disciplined, but they need warmth. There has to be, they, they, work, they have to work together. Harmony. And harmony is connected with the third sphere, which is beauty, beauty. And this corresponds to the three fathers of the Jewish people. Abraham stands for love. He stood, he taught the whole world about that there's, a one, there's one God and we don't believe in idols. But he's an invisible God. And how did he do it? He did it by, he, he established the very first Chabad house in history. You've probably heard about this, that he had a tent and it had openings on every side, four doors. And he looked, it was even this week's Parsha. Vayera starts off with Abram sitting in the door of his tent, looking for people who might be passing by, because that was his, his, his love, was to be hospitable, take people in and give them what they needed. You met people like this. They're, they're not so common, but they're, very, they're a lot of fun. What can I do for you? And they just, they go out of their way to provide whatever you need. Food, clothing, place to rest, company. Acceptance. But then there's a, there's a, a, a bill that comes along with it, which is, now you have to say a bracha. And they teach you to say a bracha. That's how the Chabad houses work. And that's where they're successful because they start out with love, but then they give you direction. The love is on the right and the direction's from the left, but they have to work together. So therefore they are called, these seven attributes are called doubles because they work together. And that's in a world of harmony. In the world of harmony, things work together. Now I'm going to introduce to you a new word. That's chaos. In the world of chaos, nothing works together. Everything is only out for itself. The world of chaos is a world of complete selfishness. And it can be very holy. Love says, I am the only way to serve God. And discipline says, no, I'm the only way to serve God. And they're exclusive. And they don't admit for one another. So therefore, it never works. The business that's run from that perspective doesn't work. You can have great personalities and great ideas, and it just doesn't, it doesn't last. There's no cooperation. There's no harmony. That's the world so we have two really distinct worlds, a world of cha chaotic world and the world of harmony. The chaotic world is called tohu. Tohu. Tohu means chaos. 
What does it mean what does chaos mean? Chaos means if you saw it, if you were to perceive a world of chaos, you'd be sick to your stomach. You'd get seasick. You'd be uh, overwhelmed by the, the, there's no stability in such a world. My mother, Olea Sholem, had a problem with her inner ear. Your inner ear is where you have balance, you know, it controls your balance. Remember when I was a kid, uh, I used to be in the swimming pool a lot. We used to do all kinds of tricks in the water, you know, somersaults. As I got older, I found I would get confused when I did these things. I wouldn't remember which way was up. Stop doing it. My mama used to say to me, Allah show them. She used to have an attack, it was called menus. If you ever heard of that, menus, attack of menus, where she would all of a sudden lose her balance. Could be anywhere, anytime. And all of a sudden, she's the whole world became, becomes topsy turvy. She just has to get off her feet and she would be, she would vomit. And uh, that's what happens in a world of chaos. There's no solid point that you can stand and relate to everything around you. The therapist will do a number of exercises with a person who's having doing rehabilitation exercises. And one of the exercises is balance. How's your balance? How long can you stand in one place, on two feet, one foot? And older people, um, I, we get monthly phone calls from my wife. First question, any falls? Uh, old people fall and hurt themselves because they lose their balance. That's one of the things that stops working so well. Whereas we saw the, in, in the Olympics with, you know, all the gymnastics, unbelievable what they did and maintained their balance and came down standing up facing in the right direction they wanted to, unbelievable. Okay, so that is the idea. You have a world of chaos and the world of harmony and balance. <clears throat> the world of chaos is a much more powerful world. That's where all the power resides, but it's, it's wild. It's not productive, it's wild. And it's described in Kabbalah as a level where life shatters its, the vessels. So life is the energy that Hashem is pouring into the world to, create, to make a, a world where, to make a creation. But the first level of the creation takes place, the energy is tremendously intense and the vessels are still young and, and small and immature and they can't hold the energy it's like when you have tremendous power and you only have a, a, a machine that can, uh, can take 15 watts oh, blows apart energy is too great energy has to be stepped down till it can reside peacefully in this vessel this container Contains the energy. So when the vessels, so what happens on this level, on the world of the level of the world of chaos, <clears throat> the vessels blow up. They blow up. So when you see war, it's a very chaotic thing. Things are blowing up all over the place. <clears throat> so on this level. The vessels blow up because there's tremendous energy being poured into them, more than they can handle. So they blow up. What happens to the, ves the, the vessels? It becomes just little sparks, little pieces of glass, or, you know, like a, you bust a, a bulb here. What happens? I'm sure you've seen these things. All the tiny little pieces. Well, where do they go? They fall down. Spiritually, this also happens. And these sparks from very, very high level of immense power fall down into the lowest level of creation. And there they find a, a place. Now, eventually, that lowest level of creation, that's the world we live in. And embedded within this world 
<clears throat> there are spiritual sparks that have fallen down from a much higher level of energy called tohu. From the tohu level, they fell down and there they are. There they are waiting to be discovered like diamonds in Africa. You have to go mine, mining for them, like the big De Beers Diamond Company, Africa. That's where the diamonds come from. The Torah even says that's where the gold comes from, from around Egypt. Nowadays, I remember seeing uh, during this war with Ukraine that there was this army, a private army that Russia was using called the Wagner Group, Wagner Group. And they, they were a bunch of criminals. And they took over this country in Africa today. And they were mining out, they, were, they had pretty much enslaved the people there. And they were mining gold the whole time and shipping it off. until uh, they got so powerful and so strong that they rebelled against Russia and Putin eliminated, eliminated them. But there you are, there's, there's gold and diamonds and everything. There's, there was a Jewish playwright, famous Jewish playwright, not religious person, but you know, the mentality is there. The instinct is there. And one of the plays he wrote when it was perhaps his most famous play, it's called Death of a Salesman. It took the world by storm, the, the theatrical world by storm when it came out. I don't know when, when did it come out? In the 1950s, maybe. 1950s, 60s. And uh, he created, he, I don't think he realized it, but he created, um, I don't know if the word paradigm is the right thing, archetypal story of the anxiety of the Jew in exile. And, and they're not religious, the people in this, it's not in, not in any way religious, but you'll see the, you see the religious theme in it. It's called Death of a Salesman. Who is the figure? The figure is a, 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 a salesman. His name is Loma. Low man. Typical American name, low man, but he's low, a low man. And he has two sons. He doesn't relate well to the sons. He doesn't have a functional marriage. He's a traveling salesman. What is he selling? What he's selling represents his spiritual failure in life. He's selling lingerie, women's underwear. To stores, you know, out in all over America, the, the small stores, that's how he tries to earn a living, never earns much of a living. And he's dominated by this idea that he had, has an, had an Uncle Ben. My father's name, all I shown was Ben, and I had an Uncle Ben, so, like Jewish names, Uncle Ben. His Uncle Ben was an explorer. And Uncle Ben went down into the darkest Africa. And this line keeps on coming up in the, in the play. And by God, he came out rich. And this is the, the, the idea that dominates his, his awareness. That, what's his first name? I forget now, Loman. Uncle Ben went down into Africa and by God, he came out rich. Well, he's obviously very poor and very frustrated, financially, sexually frustrated. What is the mushal? What does the play symbolize? It symbolizes the descent of the soul into this physical world, which is like darkest Africa. And there, there are riches. And if we know how to do it, we can come out rich. What are the riches? Not diamonds and gold. Physically, diamonds and gold spiritually. 
What is a diamond? What is gold? Every time we do a mitzvah, we're taking something from the physical world and using it to serve Hashem. And the energy that's in it is Hashem's energy. And that energy comes from the world of Tohu. And it fell down into the darkness of this world. And there it is, trapped in, in physical things. What, which physical, physical things? Well, there are physical things that we can use. And when we use them, we release the energy that's in them and it, become, it returns to its source only now in a world of harmony. I don't know, we've taken it, it originated in a world of chaos and we use it in a, in a deliberate way to create something godly. So you look at it and you say, oh, that's a godly thing. A girl dresses modestly and, and the, all the school children get on the subway and they're dressed differently and she's polite and they're noisy. And someone notices and they said, hmm, why are they different? I can remember when I was a teenager seeing religious people and thinking, why are they different? I was embarrassed. I'm not like that. I don't want to be like that. Why are they like that? Why do people identify me with them? Because you see that something godly is there. There's something orderly. There's something beautiful. Someone leaves some money on the counter in the bank and walks away. A religious person comes over and says, excuse me, did you, did you lose this? Is this your credit card? Oh, thank you so much. And they know that's a religious, that's a religious person. They're an ethical, ethical person, kindly person. They're kind, kindly people. God is kindly. And you've elevated that credit card you've elevated through your good deed. Or if you take a cup of coffee, you say, I said a bracha or earlier, take a sip. You say a bracha, you, what's the blessing? Blessed are you, Hashem, our, our Lord, King of the universe, who creates this cup of coffee. So the energy in it, you, you've declared that this energy is godly energy. Ah, oh, now it can return to its source in a world of harmony. You elevated it. There's a famous story about the Baal Shem Tov once went with his Talmudim, with his students, to a place in the woods. Good morning, Simcha. Simcha Tzivya. To a place in the woods, and he dug a hole and took some mashke, some vodka, poured some in the hole, poured some in a cup, and gave some to the Talmud. And they all said, L'chaim, L'chaim. They all said, Abraham, and said, L'chaim. Nobody knew what it was all about. The Baal Shem Tov explained that there was buried there an apostate Jew who had converted to Christianity. And in the end, through all kinds of circumstances that it's a great story to tell, but not for now, decided to give up his uh, facade of Christianity and to return to his Jewish roots. And he ran away from the place for, of his employee and he, he, didn't, he was elderly and he didn't make it. And he passed away here and the Baal Shem Tov went to that spot and they all said a brach and said l'chaim to elevate his neshama, to return it to its source in holiness. And the same thing happens whenever you say a brach. Or if you get somebody to light like the Shabbos candles. Or if somebody comes to the koisel, like a story I just read about a person who in his 80s was a survivor of the Holocaust who had not put on to fill in and since... Uh, his bar mitzvah refused and somehow the shaliyah convinced him to do it or even an acquaintance because everybody is really a shaliyah for this and he put on tefillin and he, he, he wept, he wept, he released all this pent up energy within him and bitterness and trauma that he'd gone through and was able to return his soul was able to return to its source 
in holiness. And that's called elevating the sparks. And that's our mission here in the world is to elevate the star sparks everywhere, everywhere we, everywhere we go, everyone we meet, everything we do is involving us in elevating the sparks. What about negative things? What about crime and hurting people and non-kosher food and so on? We elevate these things by not doing them. So we do things, there are things that we can do to elevate the sparks and things that we refrain from doing to elevate the sparks and the, the latter ones the, are the negative commandments of the Torah. So we have negative commandments, which we do with love, and we have negative commandments we do with discipline, by holding back, by guiding others in the right way. So we have love and discipline interacting, which is higher? Discipline is higher. Because when you elevate something by doing something, there's a limit to it. It's great, but there's a limit. The limit is how much you can focus, how pure are your intentions, how deep are your thoughts, how full is your heart with love, they limit how much you can accomplish with your mitzvah that you do. However, negative mitzvahs, there's no limit. There's no limit because you don't do anything. It's totally without any form or limitation or size or measure. Like, you go to the Joseph's Dreamburger cafe there and you have a, a burger on a bun at uh, three o'clock. And then a few hours go by and you're very busy and you're shopping and you come back from Manhattan and you're tired and you want a cup of coffee and you take your cup of coffee and you put it in some, you go, oh, almost had that cup of coffee with cream and sugar. Only three hours went by. You have to wait six hours after the burger. And you didn't do it. So you elevate the cream in the, in the coffee by not having it. That's the discipline aspect of doing mitzvahs. All right. So we learn this, these things from the seven days of creation. We'll talk more about them. We'll analyze the whole the whole thing. Okay. Page 67 in the middle. The same way, same thing applies in the soul of a person. Our spiritual makeup is also just like in the creation. Hashem has three intellectual sources and seven days of creation. The three intellectual sources are called mothers, because mothers have children. The children are the activities that are generated by, by our, our ideas. So even in us too, we also have seicho, and we have midis. Midis means emotions. Midis, the word mida actually means, the, re, the real meaning of the word mida is a measurement. Measure for measure, you know, what goes around, comes around, the way you behave to other people, that's how the world will behave to you. And you start a whole process of behavior by the way you be. You behave nicely, somebody, so they behave nicely to someone else, and they behave to someone else, and so, until someone comes and behaves nicely to you. It's not a direct thing. You've created more good feeling in the world. And similarly, Someone in the family is not in a good mood. And you need something. And you're a little, maybe a little bit abrupt about asking for it. And you get an abrupt answer. So you're not in a good mood. 
and you come and someone says good morning, you say, mm. so they're not now you're you spread the not good mood around until the not good mood is going to come back at you until you break out of it. How do you break out of it? Smile. My mother, Allah used to say, give your face a holiday. They say the scientists say that there's more muscles involved in frowning than in smiling. Just give your face a holiday. Smile. When you're smiling, you ever heard that song? When you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. This is from the 1940s. You know, when you're crying, it brings on the rain. So keep on smiling, keep on smiling, and the whole world smiles with you. <laughs> Yeah, so in the human soul also, we have these two general levels of intellect, seicho, and midas. So the midda is the measure of what you are. Your midas measure your character. They become the measure of your character. So that measure for measure literally means what you measured out to others gets measured back at you. So the Egyptians, classic example, the Egyptians drowned the Jewish children in the Nile. Midah Kenegad Midah. When the Jewish people left Egypt, how did they leave? That all the Egyptians were drowned in the same river in which they drowned the Jewish children. They were, they were stewed in the pot that they stirred up for, the, for others. Measure for measure. And this law of measure for measure is universal. It's universal. So when good things happen to a person, he should just do more. And when bad things happen to a person, he or she has to look into their heart and into their activities and say, what have I been doing wrong? Because I'm not doing anything wrong. Things aren't going to happen wrong to me. Unless we get, we put some spiritual factors into the, into the formula, into the equation. And it could be that the wrong things that you have to work out were performed even by you in a previous incarnation. Uh, I'll just conclude today's shir with this story, very brief story, just the main points of the story is there was once a very bright young man in the Jewish community in a few hundred years ago, okay, small Jewish community, and he was too bright for his own good, couldn't stand sitting and learning the whole time, it was too easy, and not, not fascinating, he became a, a thief. And he was very good at it. Very, very good. And uh, a couple of stories that start out like this, so I don't want to get them confused. But anyway, this person, one thing, he sort of went nuts. And he went into the church and he, he smashed all the idols that there were in the church. There were a lot of idols in churches. You don't have to go and see them. I did that in my misspent youth. I was actually a tour guide in Italy. And he went into the, the church and he busted all the idols. So of course, they, he was arrested and he was executed. And they didn't know the Jewish people if they should bury him in the Jewish cemetery or not because it's like he committed suicide. It was quite clear if he's gonna do that, they're gonna, he's gonna get killed. So he commits suicide, there's, it's very serious. They need special permission to bury a suicide together with other people, other Jewish people. And I think the Rebbe got involved or maybe some other Rebbe got involved, but it sounds like a story from the Umavacher Rebbe. I think it's in Sipuri Hasidim, book of stories called Sipuri. Wonderful book of stories. It's translated into English called Sipuri Hasidim. 
And they said, yes, because he was a reincarnation. He was a reincarnation of someone who had set up idols and caused other people to worship idols. Jewish people. And therefore, he had to fix that, had to get fixed. And this is how it got fixed, measure for measure. Since he set up idols, so he came back, his neshama came back to break the idols. And the Rebbe Paskin, he should be, he should be buried together with everybody else. Interesting. Hmm? Okay. So we have Seicha, we have Midas. The Seicha in a human person is wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, right side, left side, back, and the seven uh, Midas, the seven motivational drivers that come from your heart. Whatever you do comes from your heart, not from your head. Your head has to inspire your heart to want to do things, but it's only when you want to do them and you feel feel for them in your heart that you actually will do them. Okay. Remind me one time, more, one more time, Florida. Diana. Diana, Diana, Diana. Yeah. Diana, Diana. From, from Florida. Hebrew name is Esther. Hmm? My Hebrew name is Esther. Oh, really? Yeah. Esther Hannah. And not Dina. You're Esther? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> So why are you called Diana if your name is Esther Hanna? My whole life I was called Diana. Esther Hanna came later on. <laughs> I had a, a good, my parents gave me an Israeli Hebrew name when I was little. So like, what, Esther Hanna? Was, was, Esther Hanna? No, it was Dorit. What? Dorit. Dorit? Yeah. Yeah, that's also a Jewish name. Yeah, so you've got three levels of names. No, it's when you say something else. Good. Yeah. I put the Esther, and then my grandma passed away, and her name was Hannah. They added Hannah. What? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Who said that? Petra? No, Hannah. Hannah. On the mark. Oh, I told her no. We don't go to push from this. I'll kill Moshe. I'll ask about how I mix for him. That is called Hoy. Okay. Enjoy this beautiful autumn Indian summer that we're having. It's very special. I can't remember ever such an autumn like this, day after day after day. I hear it was very nice. Have a good day. You could also.